Gentlemen, thank you for coming tonight to our uh, our first lecture. Um, our club is called the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Uh, we're a brand new club on campus. Um, Intercollegiate Studies Institute, its basic goal is to teach the student body of the true pr um, principle of free society. Um, ISI is the main host. We also have the Intercollegiate Studies Political Action Committee as another host the Jack Murr Forum, uh, Forum of FAU, and the Conservative Press, now it's actually called the Liberty Press. Um, they're all hosts, and of course, Florida Atlantic University. Um, we have an amazing guest speaker here today. Uh, his name is Representative Rick Green. Uh, just a, a little bit of a background on him. He is a former state representative in Texas. Um, he is one of the most dynamic speakers I've ever heard of. Um, I, I know him from a school in Texas called Patriot Academy that trains young adults how to be uh, lobbyists, activists, and politicians in their communities. And he is actually the founder and president of the organization. Um, and I just want to thank you for thank him for coming such a short notice and coming in this rain, and all of you coming out and carrying this weather. I know you guys would rather stay home and, uh, and and just or go to class or whatnot. I know some of us skip class. Um, to get some credit uh, from Dr. DeRosa's class. But uh, again, thank you again. I know we're going to enjoy the speaker. The topic is, was America founded on Christian principles? In the past couple of decades, we, um, we've seen uh, some questions um, in the History Channel and so forth of our founding fathers were Christians or deists or atheists. And I believe Rick Green's going to shine some light, shine some light on those issues. Um, he's a dynamic speaker. He has a plethora of information. He actually is from an organization called Wall Builders that have so much, um, uh, many more uh, documents of the founding fathers than any other or, um, organization in the nation. So um, I just want to introduce you all to Representative Rick Green, who's going to speak to you tonight. Thank you. history lesson. Some of you might be like I was. I hated history when I was in high school and college. I had no interest in what happened yesterday. I was kind of a type A person. My wife says type triple A. I want to know what's happening today, what's going to happen tomorrow, who cares what happened uh, in the past. But when I got into law school, that started changing. In law school, I started reading the opinions of these judges, and I realized that that judge's perception of history was determining their decision today. When I got into legislature, I realized my colleagues' perception of history was going to determine their decision and where we were going into the future with regard to our law. So history is actually quite important, uh, and I began to get a little more interested in where we came from. It, it really doesn't matter unless it's going to impact where we're going. And, and I want to broaden our topic a little bit tonight from just whether or not we were founded on Christian principles, because why does it matter whether or not we were founded on Christian principles? And the reason it matters is because that impacts the type of society that we have, the type of principles that permeate our culture, and then, of course, it impacts our philosophy as we, as we move into the future. We'll start with President Wilson. He put it this way, a nation which does not know what it was yesterday does not know what it is today nor what it's trying to do. We're trying to do a futile thing if we do not know where we came from or what we've been about. So that's what we want to try to do tonight is capture where we came from. What did our founding fathers truly believe? What did they intend? What did they put in place for us as we take it into the future? And I want to try to think about what we need to do as citizens of America to preserve what we've been given. Because we've got a duty and responsibility not to just enjoy the fruits of freedom, but actually to participate in this process and to be a part of preserving it for the next generation so that we can take the torch that was handed to us as we live out our freedom and pass it to a, a new generation uh, that understands the value of what they've been given. So we're going to have to go uh, quite a bit back, you know, and here's the good news, those of you that don't like history. This is a great story. It's an incredible story. We live in the most successful nation in the history of the world. I mean, clearly our founding fathers had to have put into place some pretty good principles. Their strategies must have been pretty good for them to produce what has become the most successful nation in the history of the world. So I think if we look at their strategies and we look at those principles that were put into place, we can learn a lot. And if you take a look at, at how things began, uh, the, the, the birth of freedom uh, does not happen in a vacuum. It doesn't just, just happen overnight. You don't just instantly end up with a free society. It's not that different from uh, the miracle of human birth. Uh, anybody out there that's a mama knows that uh, it doesn't happen on the day of the birth. That's not when the conception began. Life began within the womb long before the actual 
they have birth. It took a long time to develop those seeds, to, to nurture and develop that, and actually for that life uh, to become uh, viable at birth. So it's the same way with freedom. Long before the actual birth of freedom took place in 1776 here on this continent, those seeds had to be developed. They had to be planted. They had to be nurtured. They had to be watered. Obviously, here in America, uh, the birth of freedom began with those seeds being planted by the pilgrims. One of the few things we, we uh, one of the many things we do not talk about with regard to the founding of this country is where they got their ideas. Where did they get these concepts of free enterprise and, and work ethic and personal responsibility? Uh, where did they get the ideas of representative government? If you go to this painting, it's, it's found there in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. It's one of the eight that uh, is in the rotunda there, and it's actually pretty interesting. When you get close to that Bible, you can actually see that that Bible is a Geneva Bible. Uh, we have one that was actually brought over uh, on the Mayflower in our collection there at Ball Builders. We've got about 70,000 documents that, that predate 1812. So everything I talk about tonight, we can trace to an original document. We're not like a lot of pseudo-historians today that just kind of make it sound good and hope that there's something to back it up. We actually have the original writings where we can take you to. Well, the thing that's so interesting about the Geneva Bible influencing the pilgrims when they came there is the only the, the difference between the Geneva and the King James was not the text. The text was essentially the same. The difference was the commentary in the margins. And it was the commentary written by those great reformers like Calvin and others that actually influenced them to believe, number one, that the divine right of kings was wrong. It, that, that's where they got the idea was what they were seeing in the commentaries, the very reason why you can only have a King James Bible in any, any territory of Great Britain, because they did not want you study. The king obviously thinks the divine right of kings is a pretty good deal. I mean, it's good for the king. It's not good for the rest of us, but it's a great deal for the king. So he doesn't want you studying things that are going to tell you the divine right of kings is wrong. Think about it. If you're the king and the divine right of kings is accepted by folks, whatever you say is coming directly from God. So everybody's got to do whatever you tell them to do. Pilgrims obviously influenced to believe that was not the case. Same thing when it came to personal responsibility. They learned on through their own life experiences here uh, that you couldn't have a system of socialism if you just said, hey, we're going to take all the food in and, and share it regardless of whether or not you work. You're going to have folks that refuse to work. And so they no longer allowed for that. If you didn't work, they followed the biblical principle that if you don't work, you don't eat. Uh, if you couldn't work, if there's something wrong, then they would help you. But if you had the ability to work and you chose not to, uh, then you didn't get to enjoy the spoils. Well, those were the seeds that began to be planted by the pilgrims. Those seeds were watered by the pastors that came along that John Adams said it was because of these men like Mayhew and, and Cooper and Whitfield, it's because of these pastors that we have our freedom. He actually said we owe our independence to these pastors that had been watering those seeds for decades and decades, even before the first shots of American independence uh, were actually fired. They were the ones given a biblical basis for the very system of freedom that we enjoy today here in America. Well, then, of course, you had the committees of correspondence. This was kind of like going with our birth analogy here, the first flutters within the womb. And all these guys began these committees of correspondence uh, throughout the colonies. Uh, men like Samuel Adams and, and uh, um, uh, who do we have here? Mayhew and, and uh, Benjamin Harrison, I mean. And then that, of course, led the committees of correspondence to the first kind of kicks within the womb. I mean, this was the point where you could feel liberty beginning to be birthed in America, and that was that first Continental Congress on, in 1774 when they gathered, and the rest of the world began to learn what these guys were really thinking of doing. But the real, the real leaps, I guess, within the womb of liberty began on March 23rd, 1775. This was, of course, when the Virginia House of Burgesses that had been disbanded by his royal governor uh, gathered uh, in secret to discuss what they should do, whether or not they should actually begin to participate in the, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, battle for independence. And it was Patrick Henry who sat in silence for most of the debate. He sat back and listened as his colleagues uh, said why it was impossible. We could not take on the greatest military on the planet. We had very little to show for it. We would not succeed. There was no point. And it was he that finally arose there at St. John's Church, and he said, An appeal to arms and to the God of hosts is all that has left us. They tell us, sir, that we are weak, unable to withstand so formidable an adversary. But when shall we be stronger? Will it be next week or next year? Will it be when a British guard has been stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength through inaction or irresolution? We are not weak, sir, if we make a proper use of those means which the God of nature hath placed in our power. Three millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a nation as that which we possess are invincible.